Hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, I'm Dinka Dijkstraat from ISWA, and I'm introducing you to today's webinar from the journal Waste Management and Research, uh, focused on the latest research from this month's special issue. Thank you for connecting with us from all around the world. In a moment, we will introduce you to the speakers of this webinar. The presentations will then be followed by a question and answer session, and all participants are encouraged to type questions in the questions window to your right. We will be choosing a few of these questions for the speakers to answer at the end. And before handing over to our speakers, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Fiodia, the City of Rotterdam, Ecomando, and Messe Munich. They are our main sponsors and we are very grateful for their support. A thanks also goes to our Platinum members. Without the generosity of our sponsors and Platinum members, it would be very hard to do what we do. For instance, bringing this webinar to you free of cost. We count on the support of our members. So if you are not yet a member, please take a moment to visit our membership base, page by visiting the link on the screen. And um, you could also reach out to our membership manager, Mr. Daniel Purchase, by writing to him at dpurchase at isla.org. We have flexible membership options with discounts for students, low income countries and online members. I'd also like to take a brief moment to introduce uh, ISWA, as several of you joining today are not yet members. The International Solid Waste Association, or ISWA, is a global, independent and non-profit making association, working in the public interest and is the only worldwide association promoting comprehensive and professional waste management and the transition to a circular economy. We are open to individuals and organizations, members from the scientific community, public institutions and public and private companies from all over the world working in the fields of waste management or interested in waste management. ISWA is the only worldwide waste association that enables its members to network with professionals, companies and institutional representatives. ISWA's mission is to promote and develop sustainable and professional waste management worldwide. We have members from over 100 countries. Um, I'd now like to introduce you to Waste Management and Research, WMR. Uh, WMR is ISWA's journal focused on a sustainable circular economy. It's a fully peer-reviewed international journal that publishes original research and review articles relating to both the theory and practice of solid waste management and research. The journal is published by Sage Publishing and comes out 12 times a year. Um, the current September issue is open access for the upcoming month, which means that it's freely accessible to you all. Um, you can access the papers presented during this webinar and the links will be sent to you after this webinar. Um, I would also like to highlight our open calls for papers. Um, we currently have one call for papers for a special issue on plastic waste, while the other call for papers is focused on healthcare waste and COVID-19. Uh, both of these are due by the end of October, and you can find more information on our website. And finally, if you have any questions about WMNR, you can contact the senior editor-in-chief, Akamatu Periyatambi, or myself. Um, you can find our details on the slide. Um, I'd now like to give the floor to Nemanja, who will be moderating the webinar. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for participating in this webinar. And uh, yes, I see that we already have 55 participants and hopefully by the end we will have much more. Uh, uh, too bad that uh, we did not meet in person this year, but uh, hopefully that uh, we are go all going to be very well. And the next year we will see on the on the X for World Congress live, and then this practice then will continue to meet in person. But uh, anyway, we have a very nice uh, webinar today, and I would like to thank you also to the speakers who who actively will participate in this webinar. Uh, I am I will moderate today's webinar. And uh, as Dienke said, I am, my name is Nemanja Stanisaljevic. I'm coming from University of Novi Sad, Faculty of Technical Science, Department of Environmental Engineering. And from already two and a half years, I serve as an associate editor of Waste Management and Research, ISFA Scientific Journal. Today, we have four speakers with us. We have Alexandre Pereira from the Department of International Development Development King's College London. We have Luciano Villalba, professional at National University of Buenos Aires. 
uh, we have Arne Ragosnik. Arne is a managing director of Unterwelt Consultant and it is and serve as an editor in chief of waste management and research. And we have Lee Dao San, practice it certified for accountant from University of Hong Kong. And Leo Dan San will give a record pre recorded presentation. So um, I would like to now invite uh, all speakers. Uh, and first, I would like to, to invite Alexander to, to maybe give some more information about him, himself and to, 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 to present his, his work, which is accepted and published in ISFA Special Issue. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you. So now uh, I'm presenting a paper comparing waste management in Brazil. So thanks for having me here. I want to show to our audience two very contrast situations. So how can we compare waste management in these two countries? India has a population of more than 1.2 billion people, six times bigger than Brazil, but living in a smaller territory. While the majority of Indians live in rural areas, 85% of Brazilians live in cities. Nevertheless, those 32% of urban Indians sum up more than the entire Brazilian population. Certainly, these characteristics have strong impact on waste management. But our challenge has not finished yet. According to scarce data comparing these two countries, Brazil generates more waste per year than the whole Indian population. While the average Indian generates between 200 and 600 grams of salt waste per day, the average Brazilian generates between 0.8 and 1.6 kilograms of waste per day. So how can we compare waste management in these two countries. The motivation for this research emerged from the need to compare countries passing through quite similar process of policy implementation but with very contrasting social economic conditions. In my PhD research, I traveled to Brazil and India to understand how stakeholders participate in the formulation and implementation of these policies in those countries. Recently, we are talking to my co-authors in this paper, Flavio Ribeiro, has years of experience working in environmental government in Brazil, and Robin Jeffrey and Asa Doro, who launched the book, Waste of a Nation in India. And we decided to explore the theoretical framework proposed by David Wilson. Wilson argues that waste policies evolve a series of drives, which start in the 19th century, made in the developed world, with the first policies to collect waste, more concerned with public health, then after the 70s, it evolved with, with the, uh, environmental protection, more focused on landfills, then uh, and which opened a series of new concepts related to work. sustainable development, which brought the idea of value recovery from waste, and then close the loop more present in the European directives after the 77 with waste hierarchy. Then attributing responsibilities to institutions like global, global uh, local governments and the uh, extended producer responsibility. And more recently with policy and technologies related to waste management with climate change. Wilson argues that these drivers are common to every country, but they vary in intensity according to two aspects, local circumstances and stakeholders' participation. We want to share this approach, which in our view seems more valuable than comparative analysis, fully based and quantitative methods, because they, they can throw light on potential success, failures, or alternative policies strategies and technologies according to the particularity of each country. Among the several findings in our research, as I do waste management research website, I'd like to highlight three aspects related to local circumstances and stakeholders participation in this chicken. The first refers to the local circumstances of the structure of companies, the decentralization of power, money, and responsibility can give us some clue about potential deadlocks 
in the implementation of solid waste management. Both Brazil and India have three levels mm -hmm. of governance, central, state, and local. In Brazil, the decentralization is symmetric, which means that the same policy formulated by the parliament at the central level must be implemented by all municipalities across the country. In India, the decentralization is asymmetric, which means that in that federal system, the state the level of state is in room, is, is in charge to rule the provision of public service, following the guidance of the central government. So the waste rules are guidance published by the Minister of the Environment, while the famous Clean Energy Mission is a national program and a campaign. In both countries, the majority of the local governments are unable to cover the cost of solid waste management. The difference is the fact that the Indian urban local bodies are subordinate to the power of the state government, which can hinder or foster their actions. In addition to the underpower in that political federal system, until quite recently, very few politicians would want to have that political image or their name associated with dirty waste management or sanitation. On the other hand, the Brazilian, in the Brazilian federal system, mayors, for better or worse, are historically strong in that political system, bargaining their interests directly with members of the parliament who need their political support for their re-election. Many mayors were elected mm -hmm. in Brazil because of their, con their contribution to public health in their communities, reinforcing the closer public-private relationship. The second point, although policies prescribe quite similar strategies to improve solid waste management, we need to take into consideration the start point when those policies were formulated. When the national policy for, for, was launched in Brazil, the co collection of waste was almost universalized, and the policy targeted to close all the sites of the country. The clean, clean Sorry, the Clean India mission focused on delivering toilets for the population. I know that here I'm talking about waste management and sanitation, but the issue of open defecation captured the attention of the media and set the priorities of the Indian government much more than the numerous dump sites spread across the country. Due to these quite different circumstances, Brazil has been able to evolve other drivers, for example, with the debates around circular economy, engaging the industrial and retail sector in the take back of post consumers. Although still many strategies with very thin results, in many cases it shows potential for improvement in the future. In India, the waste rules are still distant for this level of engagement with stakeholders. And this circumstance led me to the third point which is related to the participation of different actors, such as business, NGOs, labor unions, the public sector, in policy design and implementation. Despite the great appeal and the support of the Clean Indian Mission campaign, made among the middle class, the Indian waste groups are not able to obligate other stakeholders in solution of waste management as in Brazil. And the, the information that we have in Brazil the culture of tripartite dialogue enables that policies to be negotiated between government, business, and unions. In this context, the private sector has learned to push its interests to influence the political agenda more than in India. But to give one contrasting example in this process is the social economic inclusion of waste speakers, which established in Brazilian waste policy. This is the result of active participation of the labor union national movement of the speakers, for example, in the formulation of the strategy. The labor unions in India, let me give you an example, uh, are certainly larger and numerous than the Brazilian ones. However, for many reasons, such as caste, different language, and the scope of their activities, their voices and interests 
a fragment among the many competing and conflicting interests at the local and state level, hindering their political bargaining power. So, as you can see, this approach allows us to gain a more holistic understanding of the complexity that affects the provision of public services in very different countries. To conclude, our research confirms the hypothesis based on the evolutionary model proposed by Wilson and Brazil and India are in the middle of this process. Two drivers are very present in both countries. The concern with public health and the recovery of value from waste. However, this later very different from the more advanced recycling strategies implemented in Europe and other industrialized economies. And these countries have experienced other drivers with less intensity. The hypothesis of a smaller population in higher socioeconomic standards allows Brazil to advance other drivers, such as environmental protection, closing the loop, and the debate about institutional responsibility of, of local government and industrial sector in circular economy. Although there are a number of Brazilians facing similar distress of lack of base service, the numbers are more manageable than in India, rely more on political view of the government and the market. However, it's important to highlight that Brazil is also an example that this process is not continuous and straightforward. Today, the country is facing the risk of setback in many environmental protection issues and institutions promoting stakeholders' participation, which were gained over the last decades since the debates of the national policy on solid waste began. But India is not less important in this debate. Probably the challenges are bigger. Large part of Indians still face lack of these needs. We can see the impressive effort of the government to build toilets for the entire population. The Clean Indian Mission website shows today more than 100 million household toilets delivered so far. Therefore, the unfavorable circumstance of large part of Indians pose top health priorities to the government. So India needs to consolidate these achievements before advancing other drivers. Uh, we need to revisit this comparison in the future to understand how this process will evolve. In our view, stakeholders' participation is the key aspect, both for the evolution of solid waste management, but also to prevent potential setbacks in this process. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, for very nice an interesting presentation. Uh, at the very end of all presentations, we will have time for questions and answers. So on the right hand side, you can see the option to, to, to ask, to ask questions and to write. And then we will all together discuss about the, the, the ask questions and the, the presenters will, will answer your, your questions. And, um, now I would like to, to invite Luciano Vilbaba to present his work published in the special issue of Face Management Research. Thank you, Luciano. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Iswa, for this possibility. So my article is Recent Evolution of the Former Recycling Sector in Argentina Within the Popular Economy, Measuring Its Impact for a Case Study in Tandil, Buenos Aires. It's the third article of my PhD thesis. So, well, what is, what, what is the informal recycling sector first? So you may know it, but uh, in every country of the global south, uh, we find millions of people who recover waste uh, to assess assistance activity. So they do that uh, either uh, at the street or in landfills, uh, and they are responsible of high recycling performance in many countries, and therefore uh, how to boost their work is a key challenge for the circular economy. In Argentina, in Argentina, we also have uh, waste pickers. We call them cartoneros. So, about my city where I am now, uh, it's Tandil. It's a city, a medium-sized city of the province of Buenos Aires, and we also have uh, our cartoneros, waste pickers. So, the objectives of my article uh, were first to to recap. Um, 
some recent change that uh, occurred at the national level here in Argentina um, related to the IRS uh, integration as part of the popular economy. I, I, I will talk about that in the next slide. Um, and second, to analyze through the Intera framework, I will explain that later too, uh, how these changes uh, with the support of, of local institutions impacted in the IRS of Tangier. So the popular economy in Argentina, uh, I'll let you a definition there, a short definition, but uh, the current definition of the popular economy can be, can be related to the 2001 economic crash of Argentina. During this crisis, um, a lot of people uh, start way speaking as a subsistence activity. Um, then they interacted with uh, popular assemblies of uh, Buenos Aires. So this is in Buenos Aires. Uh, and they finally formed a heterogeneous movement with, which defended the cardinal's right to work called the MTE, so the Excluded Workers Movement. Uh, so the MTE uh, was really, really active during the uh, zero waste law debate in the Buenos Aires city in 2005. Um, they finally uh, negotiated to, uh, to stop the, the idea of burning waste. And, they were recognized as a key actor of the waste management of the city. So after this event, they formed an alliance with other sectors of what is now called the public economy. So that's people who finally in invented their own job because they were excluded of the labor market. So it's waste speakers, but also uh, peasants, uh, ambulance vendors, artisans, etc. So uh, an important uh, date is also in 2011 when they formed the Confederation of Workers of the Popular Economy, the CITEP. That was an unofficial uh, trade union, uh, labor union of um, workers of the popular economy. And then in 2016, where, uh, when in the context of a new crisis, first the step was recognized as an official trade union of workers of the popular economy. It was really important. And then at the end of the year, where in, uh, they, they organized uh, protests, uh, rallies uh, because of the uh, crisis, and they uh, pushed the government to enact the social emergency law, which included uh, a complementary so social salary for workers of the popular economy. That started in 2017. So the, my interest was to uh, analyze how these changes impact in, in, in my city. So the interim framework, uh, you should uh, read uh, this paper of Velis et al. Uh, 2012 to have a detailed uh, description. But and also you have a right to use Excel file uh, as a supplemental material of my, my article. Um, the interim framework is, is form of four indicators. So three of them are related to the uh, relationship between the IRS and the external, the outside world. So the solid waste management interface, the mattress and value chain interface, and the social interface, and a fourth um, indicator which uh, measure the organization, the level of organization and, and empowerment of the areas. And we say that it in, enables the progress in, in the other indicators. So every indicator is bounded between zero and one. Uh, that's because uh, it's calculated by the average of um, the achievement of some intervention points, which are key factors that can improve the role of waste pickers or the, the living conditions. And each intervention point is calculated uh, as the average of scores in at some specific, specific actions. So that allow the achievement of the intervention point. As an example, in the materials and value chain interface, one intervention point is the quality of the materials received by um, the IRS. So one specific action is to uh, have a source segregation program to, to warranty some um, the quality of these materials. So interval is integration radar. So that's because we can uh, graph these uh, indicators in a, in a radar like this. Um, and that's why well, I, I, I made in my study. Um, my methodology was to first uh, define several moments in which I will apply the interval framework. Uh, and because the IRS standard had some ups and downs, I decided to apply the interval framework at the beginning and at the end of each cycle. So 
Also, at the end, to find um, further improvement pathways uh, to the area in Tandil. So, the baseline situation of 2014 was that uh, well, uh, waste pickers were not taken into account. Uh, different NGOs and associations start uh, recycling programs. Um, they were supported by the local municipal government, which opened a, a, a recycling station called the King Point, uh, which received the materials from from, the, from people and they then give to these associations. So NGO, uh, the NGO Punto Verde uh, contact uh, waste pickers, but the, this was not really um, significant. Um, in 2015, we started the project because uh, some ex members of this uh, NGO Punto Verde, with four with speakers, uh, started the project to, to have a cooperative, so, really form a cooperative, uh, a legal, legal uh, organization. Uh, and they asked support to the university, and then we started to, to work. The idea of the project was to give visibility to the to the white speakers' work. Um, well, then we we work with students. We we define a green zone of uh, source segregation. We work with the white speakers here. Um, we organized workshops. We went to the radio and to the newspapers. Um, well, this was um, this had some impact. Um, we. They, they, the cooperative uh, managed to, to negotiate with the municipal government to be uh, or receive materials from the second uh, clean point. And this was achieved, but soon after the, the, cooperative, the cooperative, which was legally constituted uh, in, the, in, the, in the legal aspect, well, it collapsed uh, because of internal social problems. So, this was um, like the end of the, this first uh, phase. Uh, we, we can see some improvements, but not in the materials and virtual enterprise and not in the social interface. So uh, the second period was uh, really important because uh, first we, we had found, uh, funds to a second project, more important. Um, the, one of the former members of the, of the project, uh, Daniel Fernandez, uh, which had a connection with the MTE, uh, where he, he became the leader of the, the second uh, start of the cooperative. And we, in the, in, the, in the framework of our project, we made a matter flow analysis, and we showed that uh, the IRS recycling was much more important than the form of secret recycling. Uh, we still, uh, we continue to go to newspapers to, to promote the, their, their work. Uh, and then the social, the complementary social salary uh, was available. So um, they, through the NTE, they started to to ask uh, complementary social salaries for the uh, the other way speakers and and call them to the cooperative to work with the cooperative. Uh, they ask, uh, they start a public campaign called uh, "A Shift to Work Now." So we support that too, uh, and one of the main arguments of the, of the waste paper was uh, the university said that waste papers recover much more matter than the municipality. Um, when after five months of uh, struggle, they, the, 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 um, the local government uh, finally gave uh, them a rent to, to a shed. So they had a place to work, but they, they did not have uh, machinery to, to compact materials, to process materials, and also they, don't, they, didn't, uh, they did not have uh, funds to pay waste pickers for materials, so they started to stock materials uh, received, received from households and institutions. So this is the end of the second period major uh, changes in, in, in a lot of, in, in all indicators, so this is important to the interval framework, so we said that every indicator uh, of the progress in indicators uh, should be uh, in, in carbon sizes. So the, the recent change in 2019, that was when I concluded this article, um, well, 
they had so the shed to work and they started to stock materials and then they could they made this first uh, collective sale of july uh, 2019 um, so with this money they pulled first um, with the help of the mte also they bought a, a, a material compactor so a waste compactor and start to pay waste speakers in a, in a weekly basis uh, so slowly they could incorporate more waste speaker in this dynamic and process waste and continue to sell in a regular basis through the MTE too. So um, now we have a, a really developed uh, integration. Uh, however, a lot of improvement uh, pathways uh, are related to the variation of waste. So uh, this is really important then with the uh, source segregation uh, problems. So, no, here. So as a conclusion, uh, well, the complementary social side was key to the realization of, of waste speakers itself to attract waste speakers to the cooperative. Uh, and also it represented uh, a mental change for them because they were receiving a compensation as workers uh, and not as uh, not as social assistance. And I think this is really, really important about this computer social side because they are workers, um, but they are not recognized uh, in, in most of cases. So the interval framework was very useful, but I think we can ask who is who in the interval framework because um, all the support and the progress was, was mainly uh, because of uh, external institutions. So uh, the MTE, uh, uh, a little uh, uh, support of the university, other associations, but the, the local government was not supporting at all the cooperative. Um, well, in the interim framework, we can't uh, see that. Uh, we see that as a limit in, in some uh, intervention points. But not clearly. Uh, and then, well, the, the complementary social salary, uh, I didn't find uh, a place to put that in the interval framework and it was really, really important. So uh, maybe we can, uh, we can find an, an improvement uh, possibility in, to the interval framework in this point. So that's all. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you, Luciano, for this interesting presentation about very important topic worldwide indeed, about informal sector, which I believe that all countries are facing with, particularly the countries which are developing their waste management system. So I believe that this experience will be very useful for this type of countries to, to see, to understand and to implement, either, to implement solutions in their own conditions. Mm -hmm. I believe we will have, we'll have different, different questions from the pub public after the whole presentations. And uh, now I would like to, to, to invite Arne Ragosnik to, to present his work and paper published in the special issue of Waste Management Research. Thank you, Arne, and please. Thank, thank you, Nemanja. Thank you very much. My, my talk is about clean CND waste material cycles through optimized pre demolition waste audit documentation. Uh, it's about a review on building material assessment tools that the paper, what the paper is based on. Uh, this presentation will mainly focus on a prototype uh, application that was developed uh, during a research project uh, carried out uh, during the last three years together with the Vienna University of Technology. So why do we care about CNT waste? It's on one hand due to the hazard potential of CNT waste, mainly or one of the pollutants uh, is asbestos, as all of you probably know. know. And the second point is um, that it's also about the resource aspect. Uh, we're talking about uh, closing loops uh, in order to make use of resources and in order to avoid emissions during, for example, burning of cement. Uh, 
and so on. And by the way, we are not only talking about human toxic pollutants, we are also talking about ecotoxicological um, aspects of CNT waste. So if we look at the waste composition of the overall waste, we see that about 70% of the waste quantity is waste from the construction sector. This includes not only construction and demolition waste, but also excavated materials. Even if we deduct and not and neglect excavated materials, on a global basis, more than 30% of the waste results uh, from the construction sector. So it's definitely one waste stream that needs consideration. So what is my talk about? I first would like to uh, explain the motivation and the problem statement of this uh, research that has been conducted. I would like to elaborate on uh, on the pre-demolition audit, how it how it's performed, what's the, the focus um, of it. Uh, then I will define the objectives of this uh, research project that I uh, am presenting here, uh, explain and, and introduce the web case application that was developed throughout this research project and I come to the end uh, by explaining my findings and make a summary and prospects. So it's about resource scarcity, as I said, it's also about uh, closing the loops and make use of the resources. Uh, and at the end, uh, it's about uh, complying with the legal stipulations. Uh, if we consider the Austrian situation or even European situation, uh, the construction and demolition uh, waste comes into focus a lot during the last years. Uh, in Austria, there is a legislation that has been implemented uh, that um, asks for recycling as much as possible of uh, CNT waste. Um, this um, regulation also demands that pre demolition waste audits are being performed prior to the demolition of. Um, of buildings. So what does a pre-demolition waste audit consist of? First of all, you need to do a test study about when is this object, when has this object been built? Is there any refurbishment that have been performed? Uh, what building construction components have been used and things like that. Um, also about how is this, how has this building been used during its life phase? Um, all these aspects allow to assess whether pollutants might be there or not. Then, in addition to that, uh, you do a field, field survey um, based on the desk study, you develop a, a sampling plan, you develop a sampling strategy, and which is to be executed during the field survey. At the field survey, you, you make your observations, uh, you document uh, whatever you uh, think uh, that needs to be documented in, with regard to pollutants and, uh, and uh, impurities and you establish an inventory. Uh, most, most probably or the, it would be best to have a quantitative uh, inventory also in order to be able to um, tender for the demolition process, for the demolition and disposal and recovery uh, process. And in order to do so, you need to assess the masses and you need to uh, deduct management recommendations with regard to the way how the demolition should take place and uh, sum up in the reporting. So it, as I said, in Austria, uh, this type of pre-demolition audits are complementary and obligatory now. Uh, they have to be uh, done if the amount of uh, demolition waste is more than 750 tons. Um, per, uh, per demolition uh, um, object. And uh, one of the big issues during these dem pre demolition audits is how to assess the mass of waste. Um, and the mass of waste is very, very uh, relevant with regard to the cause of disposal. And thereby, there's a lot of um, discussions, a lot of um, problems at the end uh, when a demolition project uh, is being executed with regard to uh, bearing the cost. So a good planning in advance, knowledge about what type and what quality of, of waste are to be expected is paramount uh, 
in order to avoid these types of problems. So the, the idea or the, the, the problem, as I said, is that uh, quantitative assessments are very hard to do and they do pose a lot of uncertainties uh, that still uh, lead to these problems. So the, the uh, idea of this research project was to develop a tool to do a quantitative and qualitative documentation of waste qualities um, by doing and also uh, to, to use uh, innovative um, technologies like uh, geometry acquisition systems, scan, scanners, to scan the building during the pre-demolition audit uh, to transform this, the scanned uh, building into uh, a building information model uh, and to visualize it in the WebKiss visualization uh, which can also be used uh, to implement additional information uh, that leads to a, a qualitative and also quantitative assessment of the waste qualities. So that is, there is three-step methodology. First, uh, the data capturing, as I said, data capturing with regard to the geometrical um, data, but also with regard to the physical data in terms of um, chemical composition, pollutant content, and things like that. Then there is the data modeling uh, with regard to uh, transforming the scanned uh, information to a three-dimensional building information model. And the third uh, phase, the third step of the methodology is to implement project-specific data, for example, chemical analysis, uh, sampling reports, things like that, or information about uh, whether a specific building component should be reused or should be um, uh, recovered or needs to be disposed of. So that's just a graphic representation of what I just said. So we start at the left uh, with the pre demolition waste audit, the recording of the geometry. Uh, the geometrical, geometrical model is uh, transformed into a BIM model uh, via, a, via an Autodesk Forge platform. This is being fed into the uh, WebKiss uh, system. In addition, also the um, information about sampling reports, about the chemical analysis is fed into the WebKiss uh, report and this can be visualized uh, on a on a web uh, in a web viewer so we did two case studies uh, one of the case studies was a rather simple one uh, that was the one uh, this tool was developed uh, uh, during the, during which uh, this tool was developed um, and the second one is uh, more complex i'll come to that later so for scanning we used uh, optical wavelength range uh, devices, contactless, uh, non-invasive and non-penetrating. Uh, you see three different uh, um, devices here. We had to find uh, out that um, the scanning is not yet that easy. Uh, it's not possible to use uh, optical lenses and things like that uh, for this purpose, even though uh, devices like this exist at the moment. Second, uh, second phase, uh, as I said, the data modeling, uh, there is a lot of attempts to optimize uh, the building information modeling. Nevertheless, uh, the current uh, approach still is to do it manually uh, in order to uh, get a better result. There is no uh, real automated solution in place yet. Uh, so the, as I said, this is fed into the WebKiss application and the representation of this uh, test case looks like you see here um, with the, all this info, additional information that I'm going to explain now uh, during explaining the second uh, use case. The second use case is a more complex one. You see on the left side the photo of this object. It's uh, a building that has been built about 50 years ago. Um, on the right side you see um, a top view. Uh, it's a rather big uh, complex uh, with a lot of buildings uh, and with adjacent buildings, uh, neighboring buildings um, that uh, need to be considered during the demolition. The three-dimensional graphical representation visualization looks like this um, of the scanning and uh, we see here that this whole complex 
consists of a lot of components. It's more than 6,000 billing components that need to be defined in terms of uh, their material composition, in terms of what waste um, type they belong to, in terms of what uh, type of uh, disposal option uh, should be applied uh, at the end of life of this building component. Um, and the problems that we encountered here is that and first, first the sheer quantity of building components. Uh, every single building component need to be um, need to be fed with additional information. Also, the, the geometrical segmentation of uh, invisible building components is a problem. As as you see, the the length and width of building components can be acquired during the scanning, but the thickness. Uh, and the layers, the different layers of individual building components, uh, they are invisible, so they cannot be scanned, and this information needs to be added to the system. And uh, the BIM modeling, building information modeling segmentation, um, is done only solely according to geometrical aspects at the moment uh, in the industry. Uh, and if we want to use these types of systems, uh, to optimize waste management, we need to do the segmentation according to material or reuse or disposal options. And this is also uh, an improvement that needs to be done. So the system, how does the system work? Uh, here you see uh, only one component of this whole complex. Uh, for this component, you have to add the information on the different layers. For example, this is a roof uh, component. Uh, consisting of um, trapezoidal steel sheet uh, uh, of tar paper, uh, extruded polystyrene, and the gravel. This needs to be uh, fed into the system, the thickness of each layer, and the disposal option, and also the uh, waste uh, type for each layer. And uh, in addition, you can add sampling protocols um, for each layer uh, wherever you uh, retrieve. Uh, samples for chemical analysis. So uh, at the end, you get uh, a table of all the different waste types derived from the demolition or derived from the demolition of this uh, building object uh, with the with the uh, set uh, disposal options and the respective volumes and masses of the uh, waste types. So this can be used as a basis for the tendering process. You also can uh, use the three-dimensional model of the uh, test case to uh, look into the, the model uh, by via, um, cutting through the model. Uh, this is something that can be used uh, if it's not if the object is not demolished, uh, but if it's uh, refurbished, for example. For these types of um, applications, this is a good uh, thing to do. So what are our findings? Uh, we, we learned that uh, handheld three-dimensional laser scanners uh, work better than compact laser scanners. Uh, they are handier, more time-saving, more powerful. Uh, also, compact laser scanners um, are uh, better on the outside. Uh, um, they, they are, if you want to capture facades or roofs, uh, on the other hand, as I said, uh, the handheld uh, laser scanners are better on the inside. Um, the photogrammetric survey efficiency heavily depends on the building geometry, and uh, most important, the depth cameras and smart glasses are not uh, applicable yet for these types of applications um, due to the uh, sheer quantity of uh, data that you generate. Um, it's not, not, not cannot be handled at the moment yet. Uh, so, with regard to scan to BIM modeling types, um, the manual uh, uh, the manual modeling is uh, highly uh, time, time time consuming, uh, but nevertheless has proven its worth in practice. Um, very important is that the, that there needs to be uh, some waste related experience or expertise uh, for the BIM modeler uh, in order to do the right segmentation of the building components. Semi-automated algorithms are already investigated, but not uh, cannot be um, used for the practice at the moment yet. Regarding the transferability and efficiency, um, uh, 
The, 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 the biggest point is uh, that the level of development depends on the level of geometry uh, and also the level of information. And if it comes to the level of information, uh, it's, uh, as I said, very, very time consuming to add all the information needed for all the distinct uh, building components. So summing up and uh, giving a prospect, um, this de development of the digital tool, of the WebKIS tool, uh, visualization tool, um, has happened there. It's applicable. Uh, it, it has a good result with regard to the, uh, to the quantitative and qualitative representation of a demolition object. Uh, whereas uh, the, the actual implementation is very time consuming and there is no market yet uh, uh, there, you know, um, not, not enough um, willingness to pay for such an information. Uh, in case the building is demolished, in case the building is refurbished, uh, the, uh, this needs to be assessed differently. Uh, that depends highly on, on the future application of the building, whether this can be done in that case. The next steps are that um, the technological components uh, will be implemented and used during uh, pre-demolition waste uh, audits. And uh, there is an, an additional uh, research project uh, that's just about to start where we can improve and where we have to uh, keep the focus on uh, improving the, the, the scanning technology. Uh, I'm still thinking of um, using something like Google Lenses or things like that to, to acquire the data, the geometrical data. Okay, so I think this is about it. Um, I'm happy to ask to answer your question after the session. Thank you, Arne. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. And uh, indeed, the, the presentation about very important and, and maybe the most dominant waste stream, which I believe that you know, this experience from developed country like Austria can benefit significantly to the countries which are de developing the, 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 uh, the, the waste, waste management systems. So thank you very much for your presentation. So let's enjoy the fi final presentation of, of Leo Dean's son. Hello everyone, my name is Thousand Lee. Thanks for attending ISWA webinar. I also express my gratitude to ISWA to let me have a chance to make a presentation for my paper. The title of my paper is Restructuring a Municipal Solid Waste Management and Governance in Hong Kong, Option in Postbacks. Before making my presentation, I would like to have a short introduction about myself. I am a practicing certified public accountant in Hong Kong. I am also an experienced green researcher with specially focusing in the area of waste related research and internal auditing. I hold a master degree in corporate environmental governance from the University of Hong Kong. My working experience coverage is worldwide, including China, UK, US, Australia, and several West African countries. For today's schedule, I will firstly make an introduction for my paper. Then I will discuss the optimization progress and problems of MSW management and governance in Hong Kong. Some option in postbacks will also be recommended. Conclusion of the paper will also be addressed. Regarding MSW policy output and policy goals in Hong Kong, the government has formulated and implemented a series of policy strategy and policy programs. Most of them were initiated by the current principal officer of environmental group, Mr. Wong Kam Singh. The policy goals are to reduce MSW going to landfill by 40% for 2022. At the same token, to set target to transform waste treatment structure. The government expected that recycling should be represented the largest proportion, 55%, in the waste, waste treatment structure before 2022. For the intention to achieve the policy goal, the government have blocked some 
policy outputs include formulation of blueprint and plan from 2013 to 2022. Some programs have also been implemented, including food waste recycling project in housing estate, food waste Hong Kong, and to set up organic resources with recovery center. The paper bring out the following problem statements. Confronted by the increasing MSW disposal in the landfill, which is policy problem, Hong Kong has adopted a series of policy instruments, which is policy outputs for waste issues. However, they could not bring favorable policy outcomes, which were seriously deviated from the policy goals over decades. Under this situation, how to solve chronic MSW management and governance issues in coming decades? 2020 to 2030. The paper will focus on one primary review question, two secondary review question, and will corroborate two propositions, which will be covered in the main context of this presentation. And we go we move to the main context of this presentation. The session of optimization progress in Hong Kong, 2002 onwards, held answering a primary review question. How and to what extent has the Hong Kong SL government successfully established favorable MSW management and governance? In Hong Kong, environmental group is the major governmental authority that handle environmental governance. Three principal officers, Ms. Sarayel, Mr. Ewa Yao and Mr. Wong Kam Singh have been in charge of the group in different periods, respectively. While we see the trend of per capita MSW disposal weight, decreasing trend could be seen from 2002 to 2011 from 1.4 kg to 1.27 kg per day. However, the trend was up from 2011 to 2018 from 1.27 kg to 1.53 kg per day. The outcomes have been deviated from the original goal in 2017, that is decreasing by 20% at the level of 1 kg per day. While we see the waste management structure, the recycling proportion, which is the pink color one, increased from 2002 to 2010 from 36% to 52%. However, the trend was down from 2010 to 2018 from 52% to 30%. The outcome has also been deviated from the expected target result in 2022, in which the recycling should be represented the largest proportion at the level of 55%. While we see the composition of MSW disposed of a landfill, food waste, which is the orange color one, maintained at the greatest proportion among the MSW at the level of over 3,000 tons per day. This highly affected the achievement of policy goals, that is, decreasing in MSW disposed of a landfill by 40% in 2022. While we see the recyclable material recovered from MSW, increasing trend could be seen from 2002 to 2010, from around 2 million tons per annum to over 8.5 million tons per annum. However, the trend was down from 2010 to 2018, from over 8.5 million tons per annum to only around 1.8 million tons per annum. Assume the, assume the annual MSW generation is constant, the existing recycling quantities are also seriously deviated from the original goals, that is at the level of around 3.5 million tons per annum. After understanding the progress, we can go to explore the secondary review question. 
what were the problems relating to MSW management and governance in Hong Kong? In Hong Kong. It is looked at that the key focus is that the Hong Kong government is weak in developing its bureaucratic and economic policy culture in its major MSW strategy and programs. While we see the major measures adopted in Hong Kong, fewer measures are related to bureaucratic and economic policy cultural development. There were few coercive pressure adopted in the major MSW strategy and programs. Unlike South Korea, it could make balance in its comprehensive MSW strategy and program through developing policy culture in the areas of bureaucratic, economic, academic, and civic, respectively. Eventually, South Korea could significantly increase in the level of MSW disposal of a landfill and increase in recycling rates after 1995. In Hong Kong, weaker bureaucratic and policy cultural development is divided by weak in transforming MSW management and governance approach from positive long interventionism to appropriately proactive governance. The progress of implementing must have policies for MSW is very slow. This brought the outcome of increasing in the per capita MSW disposal rate. For economic policy cultural development, food based recycling enterprise cannot be boosted up. At the same token, there is a lack of force to stop the food waste. Probably have very little incentive to deal with food waste properly. The misalignment between cost and benefit distribution also brought the outcome of decreasing in recycling rates of low value items. Finally, we go to explore another secondary review question. How can the MSW management and governance in Hong Kong be improved this upon? Firstly, I propose to build strategic innovation from a benchmark case in South Korea. Hong Kong should actively learn from South Korea in the MSW strategy formulation and program implementation. The most important is to build strategic innovative mindset to construct a resources circulation society. Don't treat MSW as waste, but as resources. In other words, to identify long-term opportunity, to assume a revolutionary posture, and to seek breakthrough and disruptive innovation. Second option in post are to create new competitive space, aim fields, and seeking inspiration from unconventional sources. The case of Hong Kong-based airlines Cafe Pacific and US-based Philcom Bio Energy Partnership can be used as an example for the future MSW policy culture policy development in Hong Kong. The partnership has generated a rubbish in and fill out model from waste to wing. With considering environmental initiative principles, I propose that the Hong Kong government can firstly provide food waste connection service, then to provide low cost leasehold land, to set up sustainable field plants for our energy production in Hong Kong. Afterwards, impose environmental levy on consuming traditional jet fuel for the purpose of encouraging allies to consume power energy. In addition, it is essential to strengthen weak public support through awareness rising program, resolving participation and implementation gap. More importantly, financial backing should always be available. Green bond issuance and socially responsible investment, investing are good 
financial instrument to support MSW policy culture policy development in Hong Kong. Last option and prospects are to experiment with other organizational structure. Hong Kong governments should actively learn from the way government structure in South Korea. In South Korea, we can see the strategic innovative vision and proof are available in the MSW governance structure, including resources circulation, race to energy, and resources and development, research and development. To conclude, through the chronological and the logistical review from 2002 to 2018, it is noted that the policy outcomes were seriously deviated from the policy goals. Through the problem discovery, the paper also corroborates the negative correlation between the per capita MSW disposal weight and bureaucratic policy cultural development, as well as positive correlation between recycling weight of low value items and economic policy cultural development. Finally, the paper also explored that the strategic innovation experience from other countries, partnership and organizational structures, for example, the MSW policy of South Korea and Cafe Pacific Falcon Bar Energy Partnership structure can bring a potential for the Hong Kong government to make some changes for the purpose of restructuring MSW management and governance in the last decade, 2020 to 2030. That is the end of my presentation. If you have any question about my paper and presentation, please feel free to email me for further discussion and exploration. Thank you very much. If you have any question for Leo Disan about his presentation, you can ask, you will get you will all receive the content contact and you can ask him directly. So now is the time for questions and answers. Uh, uh, we received some questions for the pr presented papers and uh, uh, I would like to ask, uh, actually I, I will first transfer the, only the, the, the questions that we, that we received and then we can, we can discuss, I, also, I, will, I will also have some questions. So, uh, question for Alexander and for the, for the first pre presentation. Uh, so uh, uh, we have question about the, the 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 best starting point for developing a national policy on solid waste management. What do you think? And this right. is a question from Tarem Vassam Rampere. Tarem, thank you very much for this presentation. This is a very important point that we highlight in our research. So there's no one specific, uh, best starting point. The starting point depends on the reality of the country when the policies are formulated and implemented. So, uh, for example, in our research, we compare, for example, the for example, while in Brazil, nine, about 98% about of municipalities had collection established, some kind of collection established. Uh, the, uh, the Indian waste rules cover water about 70%. While in India, composting of waste is I mean, well used mainly in rural areas. In Brazil, it's almost non existent. So it's the capacity of each country at the moment that policy is formulated and how the policies relate. With us, there's no one best solution, one best starting point. Starting point depends on the characteristic of the country. Or perhaps clarify the question. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I, I have one question for you. Oh, uh, <laughs> some very important two countries from global perspectives in terms of waste management like India and Brazil. Yeah. And uh, 
as you said, at one point, the prioritization of waste management for stakeholders is very important yeah. in these countries and in worldwide as well. So from, from your research and your understanding of, because there are a lot of different problems in different areas in these countries, not only waste management. Yeah. So from your understanding of overall situations in Brazil and in uh, India, how do you think what would be the best model to 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 prioritize waste management activities for for stakeholders so in my view uh, the countries should establish forums to bring contribution for stakeholders for example countries like brazil india south africa and other large countries have a lot a huge complexity in several regions, different kinds of, of groups involved. So we need to bring the stakeholders to debate solutions. There's no one solution for this. And you have to open this debate in society to start to start for the priorities or the areas that uh, government will uh, act. Just for an example, Brazil, there is a, a, a different type of waste. The take back of different types of waste has been discussed with different sectors. Each sector, and when you went in the debates to understand, for example, how to take back a uh, package, plastic bag, how can you uh, take back, for example, the, the waste of, of medicine, of the industry of medicine. So you need to bring all these the industries, the people affect, to try to find solutions. And for me, uh, this is the way that countries should prioritize the uh, activities on farm based management. Thank you very much for discussing yeah. the Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, there are a few questions for, for uh, Luciano. Uh, Luciano? Are you here? Yes. Yeah, thank you for a very interesting case study from Argentina. Thank yes. you. Yes, so hopefully very soon we will we will all we, we all could travel to Argentina to experience yeah. in person. <laughs> yes. I hope so. And um, I, I, I think that this informal recycling is very important for transition in developing countries, mm -hmm. for Southeast Europe as well, and for Serbia, for my country. And uh, as far as I understand from your paper and from your presentation, you have some some experience in, in, in integration of informal recyclers into the system. Uh, so I have I have two questions for, for you. Okay. First one is uh, how did from practical and implementation point of view, how did Argentina uh, worked on uh formalization and legalization of this informal sector this is one question and the second one uh how did the informal sector uh reacted to this formalization so do they want it to be included or they did not want it to be included and to which to which level well uh okay regarding the first question um uh, uh, I think it was a really um, self-organization process, uh, really important in Buenos Aires after the 2001 crisis. So they they were too, a lot a lot of people uh, making uh, as way speaker working as, as way speakers, and they start to organize uh, them themselves and to and to uh, ask for support, but also. Um, unionizing, so having some leaders and and then I think the most important part was uh, the coalition with these other sectors of what is called the popular economy because this uh, allowed the, well, the the complementary social salary and this was really a measure that impacted in, in other cities that were not Buenos Aires city because in Buenos Aires city uh, the integration of the informal uh, recycling sector uh, was made uh, so from the the, the zero waste law, uh, but in, in 
other cities like Tandil, uh, where this was not uh, an, an impact. So what really allowed uh, a change was the social complementary um, the community social salary and the nexus with the, the MTE and all the, their experience. So I don't know how it is in other uh, provinces. I think a lot of um, information can be uh, uh, looked now uh, on, on how the complementary social salary impacted in other province, uh, provinces. So, uh, but here in Tandil, it was the social, uh, the complementary social salary that really changed uh, things. And the second question was on how the informal sector were. Um, here we had maybe 90, uh, 80 uh, voice speakers. Um, then uh, some of them worked at the landfill. So the work at the landfill is, is hard, it's difficult. Uh, some people, well, they are uh, used to uh, work alone. So it's really individual activity. So uh, that's why the complementary social salary work is so important because if there is not uh, some something to offer to them, they they will uh, they, they stay working alone and they they can't see the benefits of working collectively. So that's why uh, it's it's hard in this sense. And also when uh, well the people who organize the the way speakers who try to. Uh, organize them. Maybe it's, it's people that is not a voice speaker at, at the base, but they are just helping and working with them. And this, uh, we have some interference uh, sometimes because we have different logics. Or maybe if I uh, try to help, I have a, I am a, a professor. So, uh, but it is important to well, when you when you have resources to to move, everything is easier. And um, then, well, it, it, it's still hard, but, but it's, it's possible. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chiano, for sharing this experience and for sharing your thoughts on, this, on these questions. Uh, we have now a question for, for uh, Arne Ragosnik. Hello, Arne. Hi. Hi. Hi, Arne. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a question which is coming from uh, which is coming from Serbia, from Belgrade, actually, from Vladica. Hello, Vladica. Ciao, Vladice. Uh, it's uh, it's about the building circularity indicators and material passports. Uh, do you think that these building circularity indicators and material passports can help in the future of construction and demolition waste management? Um, in principle, I think, yes, it's a good movement to, to, introduce, to introduce these types of uh, indicators. Uh, we envisaged the same thing about 30 years ago with the um, energy pass for buildings. It makes a difference and it, may, it, it um, is a marketing argument or it, Selling argument uh, for uh, for reality estate uh, for, for building objects. So this could be the same for um, material passport. However, uh, looking at the closing the loops and, and resource efficiency in the in the construction sector, it's all about the enforcement of regulations. The regulations are in place uh, at least in Middle Europe and Europe are in, pla are in place, but the actual practices. At the demolition sites are not not always like they should be. It's at the end the decision whether something is going to be recycled or disposed of is being done based on on market considerations of the demolition company. It's not being done based on the on the quality of the waste. Uh, and so I think on one side the market for recycled aggregates for recycled uh, building materials needs to be um, improved, needs to be created more. And on the second side, there, there must be some enforcement uh, during the demolition uh, process in order to, um, to improve, in order to enhance uh, reuse and also recycling uh, over disposal. Okay, 
Thank you. So basically, when when you are talking about the quality and the market, so the, the the quality of material is definitely constrained by the content of hazardous substances. But at the moment, it can happen that sometimes there is a market, even if this is potentially hazardous, and that market can accept it. Yeah, there, there is a risk. There is a risk that uh, pollutants are going to be reintroduced into the material cycles, and I think this is also important in the on the demolition side to enforce the removal of pollutants. And um, it's not only human toxic; it's also ecotoxic ecotoxic uh, components or, or pollutants that, that need to be um, taken care of in order to create clean material loops. Um, I think this is, a, this is an important aspect, and only if the quality of the recycled material is high enough, then there will be a market, then there will be a real recycling, and then there will be a real closure of the loop. Otherwise, it will, will work in the short term, maybe, but in the long term, it never will work. So, basically, it means that if we want to have this long-term sustainable solutions that we need also market-oriented interventions where market is regulated on a way that will not accept specific stream with specific substances inside for, for example if uh, if um, um, new building objects are being constructed and if it uh, if it's standard for the construction of these objects uh, one condition could be to use a certain percentage of recycled materials uh, or Another uh, another uh, condition could be to um, make sure that the building components are recyclable at all. In, in principle, this is also is already implemented in the European legislation um, in the all uh, Produkte Verordnung building products uh, ordinance, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not implemented in the real real construction sector mm -hmm. life uh, yet. So this is something that needs to be done during the next years in order to really make a difference. Thank you, Arne. Thank you, as thank you. And as we see, not only developing and transition countries have problems with waste management, but also developed countries. So, yeah. so we are in the we are in the field which is always ev 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 uh, developing and uh, and evolving. So. I think we are on the safe side <laughs> concerning our jobs. Yes. Yes. Uh, thanks you. Thank you once again to to all speakers, to all participants, to ISFA and to Waste Management Research. And hopefully next year we will see you all in in Athens on the World Congress live. So, hello to everyone and bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> thank you. Everybody. Bye.